Hello everybody and welcome to my video on this very exciting rangefinder camera, the Yashica Lynx 14. This is a high-end 35mm full-frame rangefinder and what I mean by that is that uh, it has very, a very nice lens. Yashica lenses on their rangefinders were just stunning lenses. And this is a 45 millimeter F1.4 lens. This is as fast as rangefinder lenses got. And uh, it is reportedly a very stunning performer. I have not shot a roll of film through this camera yet. Uh, it has a cadmium sulfide light meter, which is right here. It has a scene meter. So we'll look out at the scene and give you a meter reading based on that. The meter needle, or the meter interface, there are two of them. There is, and they're both match needle. There's one in the viewfinder, and there's also one on top of the camera, which is the one we're gonna use for this video. It has a leaf shutter with shutter speeds of one second, up to one five hundredth of a second, and bulb. And the flash sync on this camera is at any of those shutter speeds. The camera uses Mercury PX625 batteries, which are no longer available, and the ones that fit in, their, uh, in, in that space today are not the correct voltage. So in this video, when we talk about batteries, I'm going to show you some different options for batteries, and then I'm going to grab this soldering iron over here, and I'm going to show you how to swap, how to modify the circuitry on this camera to install so that it can use modern batteries of the modern voltage. This, the target market for this camera was the high-end amateur. It, it, say amateur only because it is such a large camera. This is not one that a professional street photographer would likely have carried around a lot, but um, could have been used for that as well because it does have a good leaf shutter with a good lens on it. Now at the time, th this has a, an F1.4 lens with excellent optical quality. And at the time that this lens, this camera was made, uh, a CDS meter like this one was a big deal because it, it was smaller, more accurate with lower light levels, and more sensitive to existing light in any setting than would have been the previous selenium meter technology. The meter interface on this camera is a incredibly easy to follow and logical and uh, very easy to read. In fact, I'll show you right now. If you are look, standing behind the camera and you look at it, it will tell you if you are overexposed, underexposed, or that black line, if the green needle lines up with it, means you have a proper exposure. So one drawback compared to other cameras, even at the time, is that this is a large and heavy rangefinder. It weighs 30 ounces, which is 850 and some fractional number of grams. So something that is gonna let you know if it's there if you carry it around your neck. The rangefinder mechanism does include parallax correction. So as you focus the lens closer, the framing lines inside the rangefinder window adjust to give you a correct framing regardless of your focus point. The dials and buttons on this camera are large compared to other cameras which of the time, which makes it very easy to use. It is an incredibly user-friendly camera. It was made by Yashica in Japan from 1965 to 1968. It was preceded by the y Yashica Lynx 5000, concurrent with a whole other array of multiple Yashica cameras, but uh, I don't know of a good Yashica camera timeline, so I can't tell you exactly what all of the other cameras made at the same time of this were. And then it was followed by the Lynx 14E, which provided an upgraded electronic circuitry. So if you have your Yashica Lynx 14, we're going to go over what everything on the camera is, and then in a bit we'll talk about what it does. We'll start here on the sides with the strap lugs. This is what you would connect your camera strap to. Film rewind knob right here and lever and post and, and uh, you can pull the post up and we'll see that in a bit to open up the film back. F uh, cold shoe, Yashica, light meter interface, shutter release button. L3 means that this is the third generation of the Lynx camera, 1000, 5000, 14. Serial number, made in Japan. 
film advance and shutter arming lever. Should not do that, I don't think. Yeah, this should, uh, this should not keep advancing every time I do that. It should stop, but uh, this was a parts camera, so that it works at all is pretty good. Frame count window. On the camera's front, we have the CDS meter window. Of course, the Yashica name again. Range finder window. Viewfinder window. The Lynx 14 badge. This is the button that you would press to power on your light meter. Your light meter will not be on unless you press that button. Here we have the lens assembly. And on the lens we have the focus ring right here. I'll turn it this way, it'll be easier for you to read. So we have the focus ring. Here we have the shutter scales and the, the red line indicates the focus point. So we're at infinity right now. Now we're at two meters focus. Here we're at 3.5 feet. Okay, we'll talk about how to read these scales here later in the video. This is your aperture ring right here. There we go, so you can adjust the aperture from F16 to F14. This is your ASA window. ASA and ISO are the same thing. So what you would do is you would, when you load the film, is you would select your film's ISO and use this knob here that's by the aperture numbers, this little button, to adjust that until you get to your film's ISO. And the range on this is 10 ISO to 800, which is a pretty decent range for a rangefinder camera. Here we have the shutter speed uh, dial, and you would select your shutter speed everything on the camera is manual. Then on the bottom, we have the self-timer lever. Uh, I, ne I never, never, never recommend using the self-timer lever on old range finder cameras. They tend to be a little bit touchy. And um, self-timer lever right here, that uh, if you crank it down this way, will give you a self-timer function. On many of these old rangefinder cameras and old cameras in general with leaf shutters, these tend to get a bit stuck. And if they get jammed, it can brick your shutter. So I don't even test these anymore to find out if they work. I just recommend not doing it. Here is your flash sync selection switch, X and M. M would be for bulbs. X would be for a modern Xenon style flash, which is any flash you could just walk into a camera store today and buy. So uh, if you are using a flash, that you are most likely using an X flash. If you don't have to replace the bulb every single time you use it, it's an X flash. On the camera's back, what we have is the, the viewfinder window. On the camera's bottom, we have the film back release right here, battery chamber, tripod socket, film rewind button. To get into the camera, you don't have to lift up the film rewind knob. It doesn't do anything. This is only for getting the film in and out of the cassette uh, chamber, which we'll see in a second. To open up the camera, you push down on this little switch here. This is the inside of the camera. This is the film cassette chamber. These four silver rails are your film guide rails. And what they do is when your film is loaded in the camera, the top and bottom keep the film from sliding up and down, which helps keep your film, Im your images properly aligned. And then these two on the inside help keep your film flat when the back closes and it, the film is sandwiched between those lines and the film pressure plate. This is the film tension sprocket right here. And what this does is help to pull your film evenly across the shutter opening right here and keep proper tension on your film. And also it keeps it from moving backwards through the camera when you are taking photos with it because film is plastic and tends to build up a bit of a memory. And if it's been sitting for a while, that can be enough for the film to draw itself back through the camera to, uh, and, and cause frames to overlap. Sorry, just noticed how dusty this camera's inside was and that bothered me a little bit. As you can see, I, I have not done a whole lot with this camera. I haven't yet replaced the uh, light seals in it and things like that, which is gonna happen later off camera. At any rate, here we have a film cassette spring right here. This keeps the film inside the camera uh, flat on, uh, properly aligned rather, so that, um, 
it, it can advance and rewind the film properly. While we have the back of the camera open, let's just go ahead and load film. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our film and we're going to drop it into the film cassette chamber. We're going to put the film rewind knob and post down until it nests like that. You want it flat on the top of the camera. Pull out a leader, advance it, or put it into the film take up spool, and now advance the film. That did not take at all. Let's try that again. Just gonna jam that in as far as I can. Let's take some of the slack out and see if that helps any. There we go. Okay, so now once we've got this started and we know that it's not going to be an issue, wrong way, take a shot, Oh, take out any slack here. We want to take slack out of the film. Advance. Now we know that the film's being taken up if this knob spins as we're advancing the film. And we're gonna go to frame one, which is three shots. And now once that one is at the red line, we know that the film is properly aligned. Next we wanna come down here, oops, to this, to the top of the camera. and we want to adjust the film's ASA, we put in 200 ISO film. ISO and ASA are the same. So we're going to adjust the ASA window until that number says 200, because that's the speed that's in there. And now we are ready to start taking photos. This is a completely mechanical camera. The battery is only used to operate the shutter, so you do not need the battery in order to take photos. As long as you know what settings to use and dial them in correctly, you can take properly exposed photos without the use of a battery. So if you get one of these that has a dead battery or a dead meter, it's not a big deal. All you need is a handheld meter or a phone light meter app. We'll talk about that with the battery in just a minute. So you can go through your day taking photos and advancing. And then at the end of the day, what you wanna do is hold down the film rewind button and then rewind the film back into the cassette. And that will allow you to rewind the film so you can load another roll. Before we get to that point though, I wanna show you what's happening inside of your camera when film is used. Film is one and done. So if you open up your film camera when you are taking a photo, it will be ruined. Film can record light exactly once, in a controlled manner with a proper shutter speed and, and aperture, or in an uncontrolled manner like this. If you open up your film back right now to take a look at your photos, you will erase all of them. If you pull your film out of your cassette before loading it, it will not be able to take any photos because all of the film's uh, light sensitive materials will be completely ruined instantly by that. So uh, this point, this is just to show you what happens when you take a photo. After you trigger the shutter, you advance the film and the film is taken up on the take up spool guided by the film tension sprocket across the shutter opening, which is right about here over the guide rails out of the film cassette. Just like that. And you can see how that's happening. And you know that the film, like I said, the film is being taken up because the film uh, rewind knob turns. And that's because there's a mechanical connection. As this advances, this film is pulled, which removes it from the cassette here. And then that cassette, the film is taped to a spool inside the cassette, which connects to the film rewind knob. When you rewind your film, you're just doing the exact opposite. So after you rewind your film, and you will be able to hear that sound outside of the camera, when you rewind your film, you want to rewind it so you don't have a leader. That will help you ensure that you don't accidentally reuse the same roll of film and be an indicator to you that it's time to develop that film. I'm going to be using this film again for, an, for other videos, so I am going to leave a bit of a leader. But when you're done rewinding the film, you simply pull up the film knob and then you dump the, the cassette into your hand and then you put it in your pocket or your camera bag, grab another one and load it. Unless of course you're done shooting for the day, then you just put the film post back in place, close up the film back, make sure that your shutter is triggered and you're done. All right, so let's talk about the battery for this camera. 
So this uses the old mercury cell batteries, which were 1.35 volt batteries. And the, if you use a modern battery, which is a PX625 battery or an LR44, A76, S76, 357 type battery with, an, with a simple brass dumb adapter like this one, you will get improper voltage, which will cause your camera not to meter properly. It will in fact cause your camera to underexpose by about two stops, which will ruin tons of photos. To change the batteries, what you need to do is grab a coin and unscrew the battery chamber right here. It uses a single battery, and I'm going to grab this one in the adapter and drop it into place. It goes in that way. On a, on a 625 battery, there will, there will be text on the top that indicates it's the positive terminal. Positive terminal goes up, and then you just screw this in place. Now this should just thread very easily. If it's hard to thread, you want to back this out because you don't want to cross thread it. If, it, if it's a challenge to thread, you're cross threading your, your battery cap and that can ruin it. Now we're going to test and find out if that worked. There, we'll get, we're gonna dial in a slightly slower aperture and shutter speed. There we go. And you can see the green needle right there is responding to different settings, which means that the meter is actually live on this camera. I feel badly for the guy who sold this to me saying the meter was dead um, and that the shutter didn't arm. Yeah, yeah, it works, yeah. Okay, at any rate, um, so that's one option. And if you do that option, if you get a PX625 or a simple dumb adapter, what you need to do is trick the camera into giving you a proper exposure because the, um, the voltage will be incorrect and your camera will want to underexpose. More voltage, lower exposure, just the way that the circuitry was designed in these. So what you want to do is go outside on a sunny day with the sun to your back, set the aperture to 16, and the shutter speed to the number closest to your film speed. So we had this loaded with 200 ISO. We're going to set the shutter speed to 1 250th and f16. Now we're going to take a meter reading and let's pretend that it says that we are two stops under. What you want to do here is grab the ISO adjustment dial and adjust it until we're getting an accurate meter reading. And then you, you push the button again and the green line will line up with accurate. What that does is trick your camera into giving you a proper meter reading for your film by compensating your meter reading for the voltage difference by using your ISO dial. Really simple, cheap, easy way to do it. Just fine. There's not, it's not going to damage your camera to do that. So that's the easiest option. Uh, that applies if you're using a 625 battery or a 357 with an adapter. There's another option you can do for a little bit more money, and that's to use a voltage adapting adapter. These adapters will alter a modern 357 type battery to have the proper voltage for these cameras. Now, they don't universally fit, and I haven't tried it in this camera yet to see if it does, but this is what it looks like, and it's got a little bit of a little resistor built into it. We're just going to take the the 357 battery and we're going to drop it in place and it looks like it's going to fit in this camera. Now these adapters are around about 25 to 40 bucks. I don't remember exactly. I've had mine for years. I don't remember exactly how, how much they cost. So the voltage adapting adapter does fit in this camera just fine. And if you do that, then you don't have to compensate your ISO setting. You just leave it at whatever the proper ISO setting is and you're fine. The only downside to the voltage adapting adapters is that they are, uh, they are expensive. And if you lose one, uh, it's, it's a little bit of an investment that has been lost. The third option is to modify or have modified the circuitry on the camera. Next thing we're gonna talk about is how to use a flash. Flash on this camera, it does not have a hot shoe, it has a cold shoe. So you cannot trigger a flash simply by putting it into the shoe. You will need to use the PC port here on the side. This is a flash cable port. So any flash you use will need to either have a cable connection or you will want to 
buy a um, a hot shoe to cable adapter if your flash doesn't and use that. And then you can still mount your flash right here on top of the camera. However, the worst possible place for a flash, and we'll pretend that my studio light is a flash, is on top of the camera because the light leaves the flash, reaches your subject, bounces back to the um, lens and the film, and it makes your subjects look flat and waxy. So you want to try to avoid that if at all possible. Better places for your flash include off to the side or up and at an angle, or if you are locked into putting it on here just because of this, the equipment that you have, getting an articulating flash that you can adjust the tilt and the rotation of the flash head on will let you bounce your flash off different things. Now the reason for that is that when we're outside in the sun, when we're inside underneath light, wherever we are we generally see things lit from above so it is how our brains perceive what is natural and correct for lighting. So if you replicate that with your flash you'll set yourself up to have a more uh, positive result in terms of your lighting results when you use a flash. That's why if, you are, if, you have, if you're indoors and you have a flash with a, a head that articulates upwards, you can bounce the light up to the ceiling, back to your subject, and then back to your film and give your subjects a more pleasing and natural looking lighting. So this, the flash will work at any shutter speed with this camera. That's any type of flash. You can, I take that back. Um, F bulbs will work at 1 30th of a second and slower. M and X flashes work at any speed. Now, if you're going to use a bulb, you want F or M, you want to set the flash selector sync dial to M. If you're using a flash where you don't have to replace the light bulb every single time you use it, which would be any sort of modern strobe, you want to use X. That X stands for Xenon. So any flash you could buy today at your local camera shop or online, you would be able to use on this camera set to X. Then it's just a matter of exactly what flash you want to use. So anytime you're using flash, you can in fact use 1 500th of a second for your sync speed. All right, next thing we're gonna talk about with this camera is how to use the range finder. So, when you're focusing the camera, this is the focusing ring. In order to know what's going to be in focus, you're going to look through the back of the viewfinder here. And what you're going to see is an image brought in through this viewfinder window, and then a little square image right here. If you've seen my video on how an actual rangefinder mechanism works, that mechanism is in here. Light from in front of you comes in through both of these windows, and then a series of mirrors reflects the light from this window onto a pellicle mirror here, so the two images overlay, overlay. And what happens is, when you focus, you'll have two images. One of them will be steady, coming into the viewfinder window, and then the rangefinder image will move back and forth as you focus. When you have them overlapped, then you're in focus and you can take your picture. Being a high-end camera, with a very, very fast f1.4 lens. The rangefinders in this would have been calibrated very well. So next, let's talk about everything on the lens, what it means and how to understand it. And I'll turn around the camera to make it a little bit easier for you. We're just gonna go from the back to the front. Self-explanatory, this is the focusing ring. Meters on top, feet on the bottom. Got that backwards. Feet on top, meters on the bottom. That little red line indicates where your focus point is. Okay, these numbers here going from 16 to 16 are your focusing scales. These are used to assist in determining your depth of field. All right, so let's say that you are focused on a subject which is, uh, let's say, 1.3 meters away. Okay, if you're using f1.4, then what's in focus is going to be about 1.3 meters. But if we stop down to f8, then everything from this f8 line to this F8 line will be in focus, and that's everything from about three and a half to five feet, which is just shy of, uh, just a bit more than one meter to about 1.5 meters. Okay, what about other focusing distances? Well, let's say you are set to F16, and you set your infinity focus here on this F16. Now we know everything from two meters, which is about seven feet, or 6.6 .6 feet, I guess exactly, 
out to infinity will be in focus. So these numbers here correspond with your aperture settings, and what they tell you is that at a given aperture, everything from this line to this line of the same numbers will be in focus. And that's why they move out evenly from the focus point. And that's why they are also, you're getting increasing depth of field with smaller apertures. That's how to read those. Your aperture ring just sets your aperture. Your shutter speed dial just sets your shutter speed. Now I'm going to show you something interesting about this camera, which I suspect is not unique to it. You heard, I hope, let's try that again. You heard there that was a half second exposure. Now, you might have noticed when I was advancing the film, I had the camera resting level. Let's try it advancing the film. Well, it worked that time. Okay, so something this camera does sporadically is if it's not held level when it's advanced, the correct gears in the shutter won't, it won't engage, leading to the shutter to seem like it's not giving you proper timing. Now that's specific to the very slow shutter speeds of one quarter and slower, quarter, half, and full second. It's just intermittent. So if you find yourself having that issue with your camera, it could just be that you need to change the angle at which you um, arm the shutter. So that's just one quick thing there. So last thing we're going to talk about is how to take a photo with this camera. And the way that it's done is pretty simple. It's designed to give you a good shooting experience, but it is also a fully manual camera. So the first thing that we're going to do after you load your film and you've set your ISO correctly for however, whether you need to compensate or whether you have a modified camera, you're going to push, you're going to push the meter reading button down and you're going to look at the needle and you're going to adjust your settings. There we go. Until you get a proper reading. That gives us a proper reading. Okay, so now we know that for the current setting or current scene, 1 125th at f16 is a proper meter reading. Okay, now we're going to uh, set our focus and that will work. Okay, but we don't want to use f16. That's way too much depth of field. So we're going to set this to 1 500th and we're going to open this up to f8. 1 1 25th at f16 and 1 500th at f8 are the same amount of light reaching the film, the same exposure value. So when you look at these, <clears throat> at the, these two rings, if you dial in your settings, any of these combinations that have both a shutter speed and an aperture lining up like this will work for the photo you're about to take. So we know that 1 500th at f8 is a proper exposure and that's what we want to do. We're going to make sure that the shutter is armed. Re-verify focus by looking through here, through the viewfinder window and lining up focus, taking our photo. It is that simple. And then advancing the film afterwards and repeating as needed to take more photos. Okay, what about double exposures? You can do double exposures on this camera and it's not impossible. It's a little bit fiddly, but I'm going to run you through it. The mechanics of the double exposure are that after you take the photo, you're going to make sure that there's no slack in the film. You're going to hold the film rewind knob. You're going to hold the film rewind button on the bottom, and then you're going to advance the film. That won't advance the film, but it will rearm the shutter. And also, you have to do those things holding the film in place and holding the film rewind button to prevent damage to the mechanism. Now you take your second photo, advance, and that's the process of taking a double exposure. The science is a little bit different. So let's say that you've taken a meter reading and your proper exposure is 1 1 25th of a second at f5, 6, just like this. Okay, so that's, that's one proper exposure. If you take a photo like that, you're going to get a, a negative, which should turn out well. If you take two photos with this setting, you're going to put too much light on the negative, and you'll end up with a negative that's called dense, dark, or thick. There are three words that mean the exact same thing, which is that there's too much light that's been put onto your negative, and the result of that is that the negative will take longer to print in the darkroom, 
di take longer to digitize, and that whether you're you'll lose contrast, both digital and uh, and and darkroom print images, and the digital image will also have increased noise. So when you're doing a double exposure, it's a good idea to try your best to have proper double exposure technique. So if we know that 1 1 25th and f5.6 is a proper exposure, and we're going to do two, we need to cut the amount of light in half. So there's two ways to do that, either with the aperture or the shutter speed. It's a matter of personal preference and creative intent which one you do. So if you do the shutter speed, we're going to set it to 1 250th. Even though that number is higher, it's a fraction. So 1 250th of a second is half as long as 1 1 25th, half as much light. But we're, we're very specific about our shutter speed. We need it to be 1 1 25th. We can also do, here on the aperture, f8. f8 is one stop smaller than f5.6. Each stop represents a halving or doubling of the light. 1 2 50th is one stop, it's half as much light. f8 is one stop, it's half as much light than f5.6. The converse is true. f5.6 is one stop up from f8, it's twice as much light. 1 1 25th is one stop slower in shutter speed than 1 2 50th, it's twice as much light. So if we know that we're going to be doing 1 1 25th and f5.6 for a single proper exposure, we need to either do 1 2 50th and f5.6 or 1 1 25th and f8 for a proper double exposure. So we'll take our first shot, hold everything in place like we need to, take our second shot. Now, once we start advancing, we're not done yet. We're going to set the aperture to 16, we're going to set the shutter to 500, we're going to put a lens cap on the front of the camera, and we're going to take a dead frame. The reason we, we take a dead frame is that when you start advancing the film after your double exposure, you have turned off the gearing for that first between those first and second shots. So it takes a moment for it to re-engage, and the film will not fully advance past the shutter box when you do that, which means your next image will partly overlap your double exposure and potentially ruin both of them. If you take a dead frame, you partly advance the frame the first time, and then the dead frame fully advances it out of the way so that you don't risk getting an overlap when you take your next photo. So that's the reason that you want to take the dead frame and the benefit that it provides when you do it. Let's say that you're taking double exposures at different times. One in full sun, and then another one indoors. So let's say that you're outside, you're using a very fast film, and your proper exposure is 1 1 25th at f5.6. We're going to cut the light in half by going to f8, or if you are very specific about the f5.6 shutter speed, then we'll cut the light in half by going to 1 2 50th. Okay, we're going to take our first photo. Now we're going to go inside. We're going to take another light meter reading indoors, and we're going to find that f2 at 1 15th, because it's much, much darker inside, is the proper shutter speed and aperture. We need to cut the amount of light in half again. We can either go to 1 30th, or we can go to f2.8. If we're hand holding the camera, let's go to 1 30th. We'll advance the, uh, the film so that we can arm the shutter, and we'll take the picture. Now, this is how you can do double exposures in different settings. Take one meter reading in the first setting, half the amount of light. Go to your next setting, take another meter reading, and use half the amount of light. And that is the technique. So a new section for the videos uh, that was recommended by one of you guys are tips on how to use this camera. So some, some tips that might not be intuitive at first. This camera has a scene meter, and what that means is that when you hold the light meter up to the scene, it's going to take a meter reading off everything in front of it, and it will, from that, tell you what your proper exposure should be. But what if you want to take a picture of a friend underneath an awning, let's say, at a cafe with a brightly lit scene behind you? Well, in that case, you just grab the camera, jam it into their face like this, stay still, we're just going to take a meter reading. And what you'll do is you'll take your meter reading with the light meter very close to your subject. Excuse me. Then you dial in your settings, recompose your image, focus, 
and then take your photo. And that's how you can use this, the scene meter as a spot meter to take a very specific reading off a small area. The other thing that you want to do is before you start using this camera, you want to verify that the rangefinder is properly aligned. So to do that, you're going to go outside and you're going to look down the street at something like the edge of a building, something that's got a sharp line and some texture that's easy to identify. It's got to be more than, this has a 45 millimeter lens, it's got to be more than 200 times that. So if, if it's a city block, we're, you're going to be just fine. Then what you're going to do is you're going to focus at infinity and you're going to make sure that the rangefinder and viewfinder objects align properly in the viewfinder. If they do, great. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to find something that's right next to you, like uh, the arm of a chair or um, a fence post or something like that. Set it to your closest focus and then uh, move the camera as close, as close as you can until it's in focus. Step away and if it looks like it's about 0.8 meters or two and a half feet, then it's probably pretty darn well aligned. You just want to verify the alignment on it before you start using it to ensure that you are going to get proper focus on your first roll of film. Whatever you do, don't use the sun as the thing you verify your distant focus with. Okay, just got to say that because I don't want you guys doing that and getting hurt. What you will need for this is a soldering iron, preferably some wire strippers and not scissors, and a part which is, here we go, these guys. This is a germanium diode D07. I will put in text overlay what, uh, there, there's another name for it I'm blanking on that is easier to find, so I'll put that in text overlay. And the next thing we're going to need are some screwdrivers. And apologies to all of my electrician subscribers. I really, really, really hate wedge head or flat head screws. They make no sense whatsoever for cameras. But everything we're going to do is using a flat head screw on this camera. We're going to stash these guys there for safekeeping. To take the base plate off, you lift on the side opposite of the film back release and you angle it off because there is this little piece of metal right here and it quite frustratingly, that's better, quite frustratingly can get hung up here which could damage the camera. We have two more screwdrivers right here, or screws here. They are a different size. Now I'm going to push down on this battery chamber because I do not want to lose these screws into the camera's body and they are brass so I can't even grab a magnet to hold them with and then using a tweezers I'm going to pull this screw out of here and set it off to the side out of camera range for safekeeping. Losing a screw in this operation into the camera's body would be disastrous, by the way. All right, so now we have this, uh, the film chamber, and we can accept, uh, access it. One thing I'm gonna do real quickly is grab a piece of tape. I'm going to tape that so that we don't lose that cable into the camera's body. We don't want to lose that, that cable. Now, I uh, would normally use film strippers for something like this, or wire strippers for something like this, but this is a really small operation, so I'm just going to grab scissors. Now we're going to need these wire strippers here. And we're going to need a length of wire. I have some wire that I got from a previous uh, dismantling. This is metering wire from another camera. Uh, I'm going to use the 26 AWG stripper here and assume that's correct, looks correct. It is potentially smaller than 26 AWG. Oh, that's like 28. It is in fact 28 AWG. Oh man, that is so tiny. 
There we go. Okay. We're going to grab <clears throat> this wire right here. Now, this new wire is what's going to connect to the... Um, next thing we're going to do is we're going to... We're going to first, we're going to wick off the solder that's on there. We want to get rid of the old solder. You know what else would have helped if I had been warming up the uh, soldering iron this whole time? All right. Well, while we wait for that to warm up, let's grab the end of this wire here and we're going to twist it. And now we're going to grab the ends of this wire. We're going to twist those. Okay. Next, we're going to need some... We're going to need one of these little uh, resistors. Now, I can never remember which way these go on. So this is a bit of trial and error. So one end of these diodes has lines, and the other end does not. Okay. I believe that the lines go towards the battery. So what we're going to do is we're going to nip this a little bit short. Nip off about half of that. This way, if uh, we mess up, we still have the ability to try again. And now we're going to get a very short section of very thin shrink tubing. This, this shrink tubing is the smallest I have, and it is probably too big. These little guys right here are solderers helping hands, and they are very useful for pro projects like this. So we're just going to set these up here. I guess that tape didn't do a whole lot of good. We're going to have one of these helping hands grab this wire, like that. We're going to have this other helping hand hold on to this diode, like that. And we're going to bring these together. We're just going to twist here. Going to twist. Okay. All right, now that we've twisted that, I'm going to grab a little bit of solder. It's not the prettiest soldering job the world has ever known, but it'll work. Now we're going to come back here and we're going to wick off the solder from the terminal. Ouch, that got hot fast. Now we're going to re-solder the terminal. This is our new length of wire that we pilfered from, um, from a Teron Vic. I, I pilfered from a Teron Vic, but any other piece of 26-ish AWG wire would be fine. Oop, touched, touched the plastic housing there. Don't want to do that. All right, once again, not the prettiest soldering job the world's ever seen, but it'll work. And there we go, that'll work. Okay, now the next thing is, as I said earlier, we don't want to have any screws around in the bottom there. We also don't necessarily want to have this down there because I don't know where the mechanisms are lined up. So what I'm gonna do is trim this just a little bit. Next, we're going to come in here with our little helping hands. Okay, we've got the wire wrapped around the diode. And again, not the prettiest, but it gets the job done. Okay. Now, I'm going to grab that heat shrink tube. I'm going to set it here. 
Next thing we need to do is give this wire uh, a place to exit. Like I said, we don't want to have the screws down there, so we also don't want to have this, this uh, diode and heat shrink tube down there. So we're going to create, uh, in, in the least, least enjoyable way possible, a little exit for that wire. That'll work. You don't have to go and you don't want to go the whole way through, but you do want to give it a little bit of an exit space there. Then we're going to grab a very, very small piece of electrician's tape. We're going to use that to help make sure that this wire oops, stays in place and that it doesn't pull free from the underside of the battery chamber. There we go. That will work. Now we're going to screw this on into the proper location. All right, we're, I'm going to assume that this is correct. We can't test it until later, until after this thing's back together, but I'm going to assume it's correct. Usually this works with the There it goes. Now, as you can see, I have a little bit of exposed solder there, and we don't want that because that could create a short, and that could cause the meter not to work properly. And let's see if we can get this guy nested in here now. This is such an ugly repair. Okay, there we go. Now we're gonna put the base back on. To put the base on, you hook it under the film release lever like that, and then just do the opposite of the way that we took it off. It will feel just a hair tighter, especially if your repair is horrendously ugly like mine was. And similar to the problems with brass screws, aluminum screws are not meaningfully easier to work with. We're going to start over here and screw it in on the far side. And we have to put this whole thing back together to test it because, come on, we need this here to complete the circuit. The circuit for the battery is the terminal in there down into the camera as well as the metal base plate. So the metal base plate carries part of the charge. So we will know that I have done this correctly in just a minute, or we'll know if I'm about to take this thing apart and start over. It works. <laughs> okay. So if we set it to 1 15th and F4, it's over. If we set it to 1 2 50th and F11, yeah, that's correct. Which uh, sounds about right given the proximity of the studio light. I cannot believe that ugly, ugly repair worked. But that's okay. No one's ever gonna see that repair, so it doesn't matter how pretty or ugly it is, it matters how functional it is. So some things not to do with your camera. Do not store the camera with the shutter ready to fire. Always trigger the shutter before you put it up for the day. The reason for that is because when you arm the shutter, you're putting tension on mechanical springs within the shutter mechanism. If they stay like that for days or weeks or months or longer on end, they can start to develop a memory which will throw off your shutter timing at best or render your shutter useless at worst, especially if the springs break. Don't leave your camera in your car because lubricating oils can get very thin in the heat and get into parts of the mechanism they shouldn't and then when they get back to their normal temperature, they will make the mechanism run at 
uh, improper times, usually slower, and that can really mess up your shutter operation. Also, the same thing is true of very cold. Very, very cold weather can cause the lubricating oils to break down and become gummy, which can cause your shutter now to then not work correctly. Also, uh, it's a really good way, leaving your camera in your car, to come out to a car that's been broken into and no camera. Don't leave your camera or lens, uh, don't leave your camera in a plastic bag or box unless you have a very good and rechargeable desiccant pack that you keep recharged. Now, the reason for that is because plastic is water permeable. So even if your equipment goes into it dry, water can permeate through it, and then that water moisture can get onto the lens, cause fungus to grow, get into the covering here, cause mildew to grow, or cause fungus here in your rangefinder mechanism. And that can really mess with the way that the camera works or make it really unpleasant to hold a mildewy smelling camera up to your nose. <coughs> Don't let your camera get wet. <coughs> Don't let your camera get wet because this is not weather sealed and the, the components inside of it are metal. They will rust and they will rust together and render your camera useless. And just remember that your camera is a precision tool and should be handled with care and respect. And as long as you take care of your Yashica Lynx 14, your Yashica Lynx 14 will take care of you. Thank you for watching this video. Please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm on the right track producing content which is useful and helpful to you. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comments section below. I'm pretty good about checking these every couple of days and answering questions. If you have any suggestions or ideas for future videos, and if I have the technical know-how and equipment, I'm more than happy to make those. One last thing, thank you everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. I gotta get up, Steinbeck. I have to turn off the camera. <laughs>